We are now turning to Ms. Tetong. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, Chairman Merkley, members of the committee and CECC staff for this opportunity. As a Tibetan who has been working on the Sino-Tibetan conflict for more than two decades, I can say safely, it takes a lot to shock me. But last year, when my colleagues and I began research into reports that Tibetan children were being sent to state-run boarding schools at an alarmingly high rate, we were stunned by what we found. Under the cover of darkness of China's near total information blackout of Tibet, the Chinese authorities have been constructing a massive colonial boarding school system that threatens the future survival of the Tibetan people and nation. These residential boarding schools are the cornerstone of a broader effort to wipe out Tibetan resistance by eliminating the three pillars of Tibetan identity, language, religion, and way of life. The schools streamline and fast track this by ripping Tibetan children from their roots, stealing the language from their tongues, and trying to replace their identity with Chinese identity. In our report, we find that at least 800,000 to 900,000 Tibetan children, representing nearly 80% of all Tibetan children ages 6 to 18, are now separated from their families and living in colonial boarding schools. And this number does not include four and five-year-olds being made to live in boarding preschools. These children are forbidden from practicing Tibetan Buddhism, they're cut off from authentic Tibetan culture, and they're not allowed to study in their own language. Instead, they're forced to study in Chinese under mostly Chinese teachers from textbooks that represent China's history and culture while completely denying Tibet's own rich and ancient history and culture. On top of this, they're subjected to intense political indoctrination. And most Tibetan parents have no choice but to send their children away to these schools because China shut down all the village schools and nearly all the alternatives. Parents who try to resist or refused, refuse are threatened, harassed, fined, and face other serious punishments. One person from Tibet described the anguish of these separations for young children. Quote, I know of children aged four to five who don't want to be separated from their mothers. They are forced to go to boarding schools. In some cases, the children cry for days, sticking to their mother's laps, begging not to be sent away, and even refusing to go back. End quote. My five-year-old son started kindergarten this year. To think of sending him away at this age, to live apart from me for the rest of his school-age life, to think I wouldn't be able to comfort him or protect him day to day is devastating. And to know China is doing this intentionally so that Tibetan children are isolated from the influence of their parents and families is enraging. In the US, Canada, and Australia, residential boarding schools for Native American, Indigenous, and Aboriginal children are finally recognized as horrific and shameful mistakes of the past. Now is seen as the time for inquiries, reparations, and apologies, not as a time when any government would be deliberately implementing this genocidal model and on such a massive scale. But this is exactly what Beijing is doing. China's colonial boarding schools, together with policies that severely restrict the use of Tibetan language, that seek to hollow out Tibetan Buddhism and end the nomadic way of life, threaten Tibetan existence in every space in Tibet. What's happening in front of our eyes is the annihilation of Tibet as a civilization, as an identity, as a culture. It is cultural genocide, and Tibetans everywhere know it. Just last month, 25-year-old Sewan Norbu, a famous Tibetan pop star, self-immolated in front of the Gotala Palace in Lhasa. He had every reason to live. He was young, successful, college-educated. He had a family and resources, and his whole life was ahead of him. But he gave it all up in the ultimate sacrifice at the most meaningful location and political moment for Tibetans on the eve of the anniversary of the 1959 Tibetan National Uprising. His life and lyrics suggest he did this because he wanted to send a message that no matter what personal success we may achieve, what matters most is our roots, our homeland, our culture, and our freedom to live on our own land and be who we are. 
Selwyn Norbu's final act illuminates a simple truth that's held strong in Tibet for 70 years under Chinese occupation. That generation after generation of Tibetans have shown their love and allegiance is to Tibet, to the mountains, to the grasslands, to our mother tongue, our great sages, spiritual teachers and leaders, most especially to His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, and not to China, because Tibetans are not Chinese. And though Tibetans in Tibet continue to battle courageously against China's onslaught, they can't do it alone. They need people and governments in the free world to step up. And there is so much more that can be done. I think global opposition to Russia's invasion of Ukraine has shown us how much the international community can do. We need to use every tool available to fight these genocidal dictators. Because a state that so blatantly flouts international rules and norms and indeed actively seeks to undermine them, threatens us all. And the fate of Tibetans and Uyghurs, Southern Mongolians, Hong Kongers, and Taiwanese affects us all. I'll end my remarks here and save my specific recommendations for the Q&A, and I'd also like to submit our report on China's colonial boarding school system in Tibet for the record. Thank you very much.